What happens after the war is over? We start packing up and heading home. Now, this is actually a really exciting video for me because it gets us away from like the white knuckle action we see in Hollywood movies. And it brings us up close and personal with the wartime realities that logistics wins and often ends wars. This video is based on a series of questions I've received from viewers uh, who are genuinely interested in how wars end and what we do with everything after the shooting stops. And I've said it once, I'll say it again, the United States military is a logistics organization that just happens to have a combat arm. We can't project force around the world if we can't feed, arm, and fuel our military forces. There's an old saying, good generals study tactics, great generals study logistics. During World War II, D-Day, one of the greatest amphibious landings, I think the largest amphibious landing in history, it was a logistics operation that took years to coordinate and properly execute. And think about it this way. The Allies had to funnel millions of soldiers and their vehicles across the English Channel. They had to feed and arm those troops. They had to fuel their vehicles. They had to provide forward operating hospitals with antibiotics, blood, other life-saving material, evacuate people back to England. Like, one can say this about Operation Overlord. The planners had some great understandings of logistics. Without powerful American logistics, World War II would have actually lasted decades or ended in a stalemate. Logistics brings a level of military might that nothing else seems to be able to pull off. And I don't think we, as a nation, have forgotten the hard-earned lessons of the past. Armies, navies, air forces require a constant supply line. Like, jet fighters are really sexy. Spare parts aren't so sexy. But the spare parts are needed for those jet fighters to keep them flying. You know, without these supply lines, there's no grand invasions, no toppling of dictators, no fighting global war on terror. You know, in an earlier video, I, I, made this, um, I made this one YouTube video about how I discussed militias taking on the U.S. military. And I mentioned how many militaries, let's just like, they haven't mastered logistics inside their own country, let alone on a global scale. When I was in Egypt, uh, the U.S. military was logistics allowed us to have this, this massive surplus of chicken patties halfway around the world and we gave them to our Egyptian counterparts because they didn't even get meat in their own country. We were a military force on the other side of the globe and we got more and better food outside of our own country than the Egyptians could get in, inside their country. Now these Egyptian soldiers never got meat for their meals in this remote area of Egypt and it shows just how important logistics is before, during, and after a war occurs. There is something about moving a lot of personal material around the world that gets me all excited, right? And in this video, I'm going to give you the skinny on post-war logistics. Um, speaking of logistics, you know, uh, from a logistical standpoint, you don't want to travel overseas without a VPN. I was just in Israel and I use PIA VPN. I am here in Israel right now. It is a beautiful country with some of the best cyber warfare practitioners in the world. And that's why whenever I travel, I use PIA VPN, both on my computer and on my phone. Look, uh, there is a non-zero chance that Israeli intelligence is sucking up my data, and I'm actually more afraid of a rogue uh, element in the government than ones who actually have permission. And honestly, you know, if you're an American, there are some states who restrict what you can view on the internet, and PIA VPN can help with that. A lot of people like VPNs because they allow you to mask your location and watch Netflix movies that are only available in other countries, and that's useful. But you know what's even more useful? Not getting your personal information compromised. PIA VPN is a tunnel that connects your computer to the public internet that hackers and rogue government agents can't penetrate. And PIA VPN works on every one of your compatible devices from your Xbox to your tablet. So go to PIAVPN.com slash Macbeth to get 83% off plus four months free and start surfing safer. Now, post-war logistics is a complicated beast and fraught with costs and dangers. Using a technical term, post-war logistics operations are usually given the term retrograde when we're leaving an area. One of our largest and most complicated retrograde operations came from our withdrawal in Afghanistan. The United States had taken a number of routes when it comes to moving personnel back stateside. And in wars past, like World War II, we saw the use of militarized passenger liners as a way to ferry troops and some wartime materiel back home. 
During Vietnam, the U.S. military contracted with civilian airlines to bring soldiers back home. Those are the so-called freedom birds. And in less posh circumstances, troops have been brought back using Navy ships uh, and even military transport aircraft. I think the last time I left Iraq, I was on a C-17. In many cases, heavy and costly ship-to-ship -ship equipment, such as American tanks, were often like left behind to kickstart local economies. They could scrap and melt down that equipment uh, for civilian use. This was the case during uh, post-World War II logistics. They actually left the tanks there, people melted them down, started a whole new economy. And uh, believe it or not, there are still American tanks as monuments scattered around Europe as a reminder of American logistical genius and manufacturing prowess. Following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the U.S. military left a lot of working vehicles, weapons, and aircraft because a lot of them just proved too costly to move. Now, sensitive equipment was packed up and sent home, or it was destroyed thoroughly to keep it uh, from falling into the hands of bad guys. Um, ironically, the United States actually relied on partners like Russia and Pakistan to move personnel and equipment out of Afghanistan. Following the withdrawal of Afghanistan, the U.S. used Russian rail and air routes to move equipment back into Europe and back into American stockpiles. Prior to the drawdown, Barack Obama's administration actually negotiated quite successfully railroad and air transit pathways for non-war supplies into Afghanistan. That was a huge part of the U.S. logistics machine. Now, politicking with regional and global partners near places like Afghanistan afforded the U.S. military to be able to cut shipping costs and supply soldiers with much-needed supplies. These routes also allowed the U.S. to funnel supplies into key construction initiatives in Afghanistan. For a while, it, for a while, it helped the U.S. build an economy in this landlocked country. With changing geopolitical circumstances, it's hard to imagine the U.S. relying on Russian rail lines and air lanes very much these days. But the, the cost of moving stuff, like large military vehicles, back home, it actually comes down to economics. Is it economical to move a tank back home if it isn't going to be used again? Probably not, although for sensitive equipment on it, it will almost certainly be brought home or destroyed in place. And uh, that is accounted for in retrograde operations. Per a 2015 U.S. Government Accountability Office post, and getting vehicles on a rolling stock out of Afghanistan can cost from $6,000 to over $100,000, depending on the route. For example, transportation by ground and sea through Russia or Pakistan is substantially cheaper than air and sea through Jordan or Azerbaijan. That ain't cheap. And as you can see, that retrograde can just be just as costly and as expensive as getting personnel and material into the war zone. It's not a buyer's market either. The U.S. is probably squeezed on prices and regional partners and companies kind of knowing full well that the gravy train was eventually going to come to an end. You know, I have no doubt in my mind they squeezed the United States for all they could. Now, soldiers, of course, are a different story. Uh, we're not going to leave a bunch of soldiers on the ground in Afghanistan, right? That's kind of the rub, though. Uh, there's an economic calculus that drives the bean counters nuts when it comes to equipment. It ain't cheap bringing people and equipment back home. It ain't cheap bringing stuff and people to war either. Um, it's not like the U.S. can just kind of call Amazon to deliver troops to Iraq's doorstep. Uh, but if you want to do that, I'm here for your Amazon. <laughs> if you're interested in a military logistics business, uh, one-click deployment model sounds kind of cool as a, as a way to counter China. The U.S. military relies on a complex and durable system of government organizations, military transportation platforms, and military contractors to get things from America to anywhere on the globe and back again if needed. And I would be mistaken if I forgot the political elements in here, too. The U.S. government leverages its relationships with other countries in order to get those things to happen. Logistics is a complicated, messy business. Now, I know there are a lot of internet conspiracy theorists who are like salivating when they saw the Taliban sporting American equipment following our withdrawal, driving Humvees, jail TVs, uh, uh, MRAPs. Actually, they probably didn't have jail TVs, but Humvees, MRAPs, Black Hawk helicopters, and these internet sleuths probably thought it was because we left this equipment behind to secretly arm the Taliban. Nah, dude. It was an economic decision, although some of that U.S. equipment was actually supplied through the Afghan National Army, and the Taliban just took over that equipment that was issued to the Afghan National Army. For the most part, like 
some bean counter in the Pentagon and or CENTCOM probably performed the calculations and said, you know what? Just leave the MRAP here. It's not worth our money to bring back. And yeah, it doesn't look good for the military when the Taliban are driving around in American MRAPs, but you can't win everything when it comes to retrograde operations. Like I said, a lot of stuff was stuff we gave for the Afghan National Army anyway. In 2013, U.S. Central Command wrote of the ongoing retrograde in Afghanistan, about 40,000 containers and 30,000 vehicles have been shipped back from Afghanistan over the past year, but strategic transportation planners said the system had not yet been taxed to its full potential. I don't know about you, but that gave me goosebumps, dude. Like, I don't even think most private companies have that kind of logistics. Maybe J.B. Hunt. I think J.B. Hunt has the capability of doing like 109,000 deliveries, container deliveries a year. Um, that level is just bonkers to be at 40,000 containers and your system isn't even taxed to its full potential. It's amazing. Now, um, <laughs> all of this equipment left behind has an interesting purpose, even before our chaotic withdrawal. As far back as 2023, the U.S. military knew it couldn't bring everything back. It was expensive and probably equally as expensive to stockpile it somewhere in Europe or stateside. So U.S. Central Command found that not all equipment needs to be retrograded back to the United States. Some equipment in the RPAT yards may be needed by the Afghan National Army. Other equipment may be selected for sole sale to friendly nearby nations under the foreign military sales program. Some may be scrapped. So what does that mean for us today? It means the U.S. military is a logistics organization. And the key to winning wars comes down to moving people and goods. Odds are the next big fight is going to be with China. The war with China is going to require some serious logistical efforts, testing age-old wisdom. we got that tyranny of distance, like 60 to 100 miles from the U.S. all the way to Taiwan. New innovations will be needed to keep soldiers, sailors, and Marines fed, armed, and fueled, and in the fight. China has the advantage of distance. We don't. They're close to Taiwan. We're thousands of miles away from home. Logistics will play a crucial, pivotal role in who wins and who loses. And, if, you know, if I were to put money on this, I would say the U.S. military has China beat. Um, but that could erode as new technologies are integrated into military logistics, such as AI, autonomous vehicles, and even just-in-time manufacturing, like 3D printing a part on a Navy ship and flying it out to a submarine that needs it. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Hey, want to support the channel? Grab my Intel Life shirt from Bunker Branding. You know, I also write a book called The Last Republic. Fantastic little novel about Brigham Young creating his own country instead of the state of Utah and what happens 170 years later when it comes into conflict with the United States. Thank you guys so much for watching. In a world where fashion meets firepower, where style becomes strategy, it's time to gear up for the ultimate mission with Bunker Brand. Introducing the Rock Out With Your Chalk Out t-shirt, a tribute to the fearless air cavalry. Feel the adrenaline rush as you don the pride of the skies. For those of you who dare from the air, precision and power unite when you think outside the bomb. And don't miss our Live Laugh Launch t-shirts for Patriot and High Mars, because sometimes defending freedom means bringing the thunder. Finally, for the true defender of the seas, we present Department of the Boat People. Sail with honor and show your allegiance to the world's mightiest maritime force. With these shirts, hoodies, and stickers, along with the tow missile, landmines, and drone warfare. These aren't just shirts, they're statements. They're your way of saying I stand for strength, unity, and style. Get yours at Bunker Branding today.